successful businesswoman who owns a business called Bloom Hall Textiles, and she is one of the most dedicated and kind of people that has ever been my good fortune to know. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please help me welcome Peggy Taylor to our lecture? Thank you. It, I, you need to tell me if you cannot hear me. I'm using my teacher voice. So we can get a microphone if you need to have one. Just wave or something. Um, it's my honor to be here. I'm very, I'm very grateful to have been asked to speak. Um, a little bit to add to the background is that I first learned to weave here in New Harmony um, during the bicentennial. So it's been a while. Um, but I always wanted to know how but there were no classes. I, I couldn't find a place or, or a weaver to teach me. So I came uh, to take a grad class here um, and just kept coming back. Um, and I really can't take credit for the fact that I'm just, weaving is just naturally something I wanna do. Um, we found out that um, in the 1600s, are um, the ancestors we could find the farthest back in Cheshire, England, were weavers and they lived at Loom Hall. And so I've taken the ancestral home name and that's my business. Um, so it's something that skipped 500 years, but I like doing it. Uh, and I've, I've enjoyed very much this space because as you see, there are two table looms back there. Uh, and the WMI has been very gracious to work with us um, on grants so that we can teach uh, weaving to different age groups. And this is a perfect um, setting uh, for learning. In fact, one of my students is here tonight um, and she's doing a great job. She's a wonderful weaver. So we wanna talk tonight about craftsmanship. And that is something that in my view is essential. If you're going to make something, you need to make it well. How does that happen? Well, you have to learn you need the skills, you need to constantly work on them, um, and networking, learning from other people, having a mentor is a good thing. Um, being able to challenge yourself and try something harder next time, every time. Those are some things that are, are involved in craftsmanship. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight. So let's see if I can make this go. Um, this is the Oxford Dictionary definition. Uh, skill in a particular craft, uh, the quality and design of the work shown in something made by hand or artistry. Um, and all of those are part of, of the whole thing, <laughs> oh, the whole um, wrapping up the whole package of uh, craftsmanship. Um, and that has been, craftsmanship has been recognized since a long time ago. Um, even in the Middle Ages, there were craft guilds and you had to apprentice for years and years and years um, before you could be called a master um, potter like Tom or a silversmith or a weaver um, or a tapestry weaver like Laura. So uh, those skills weren't just picked up. You, you learned from somebody, but that was good because the legacy of how you did those things was passed on. People could teach the next generation and the next one. So nothing was lost in terms of the skills. Um, there is actually uh, one weaver that I know of in New Hampshire that weaves the type of coverlets that were only woven in the 17s and 1800s. And you'll see a loom like that later on in my talk. Uh, but he has delved into textile history. He, when, he, when he talks about textiles, he uses terms even I don't know because he's gotten them from the old books and so if he's going to weave, he does it right. He learns what the terms were. He learns how they used their looms. He learns what textiles they used, what dyes, and so on. And so that's sort of a goal that I have, is to learn uh, more and more about what people knew at one time that's uh, in danger of getting lost. So we'll go to the next one. So some of my inspiration, what I like to look at, I'm very history-oriented which is how I landed here. Um, but a lot of the um, historic textiles that you will see in museums or in private collections um, tell us a lot about the person. Sometimes they don't tell us much, but even by looking at how they did what they did, we can learn a lot. These are samplers, and these were done by children. So 
Uh, one of them says in the um, 10th year of her age, this one on the right. This is a 10-year-old that did all of those stitches. Those are stitches on hand-woven linen, so they're probably something like six to eight stitches per inch, cross stitches. And this was all done by this child. Um, and so was the other one. The other one was a sampler. That they were a way for children, girls, to learn how to mark the textiles that they would have in their home later on because the handwoven textiles, were, they took so long to make and they were so valuable to the family that they were listed in the inventories. They were, they were listed on a person's will. So it would be so many sheets of linen, um, the bedstead that went with it. They might pass the loom down uh, through the family. Um, so these were things that helped them learn the skills they would need to run a home. So we're talking early 1800s, okay? This one's 1837, uh, this one's 1806. Now, the samplers like that were done um, in Europe, in England, but when, they, when everybody came over here from those places, uh, that was one skill that was carried over. The children were supposed to know how to do this. Um, I'm not sure what the boys learned, because I don't study that. But anyway, the girls learned how to do this. And I picked this one on the right because you can see the sheep. I like this kid, you yeah? know? Yeah. So anyway, um, some of the historic textiles that we can study don't look real impressive. This is a shaker blanket. It was all hand spun wool, hand dyed for the dark checks. You see a seam down the middle and you see initials up in the top in red. This is how you can tell an older textile if you have no provenance. The seam down the middle means that it was woven on a home loom and they are only so wide. Maybe the widest might be 32 inches. So to weave a blanket for your beds, which they wove a lot of, you would weave twice as long as you wanted the blanket, cut it and bring the other half down and seam it down the middle. As you can see, this was probably a younger weaver or somebody that was just weaving for the home because the lines don't match up. Uh, the professional weavers made sure that everything lined up for the, for the two halves. Uh, but if you just wanted a blanket and you just wanted to be warm, this is what you did. Um, so this would have been natural wool and then either uh, dark wool from a black sheep's fleece or dyed, probably with walnut or indigo. Those are the, the common dyes you would have seen. And then we look at a little fancier textiles, and I like studying these because I like weaving this type of weave. It's called overshot. And what that means is some of the threads float over the ground fabric, and then they float over another section. And so you see geometrics that can be made. The first example, the blanket could have been made on a two harness loom. Just you can do plain weave on it. Okay, like a potholder, weaver, that kind of thing. This takes a four harness loom. And that's what you see in the back. So after the talk, if you wanna go back and look at a four harness loom, these are miniature versions of the big looms that I weave on. But they have four harnesses, and because they do, you can do geometric patterns with them. Like the twill blankets that are up here are four harness and are geometric, and then this overshot. And there's a lot of different overshot patterns, quite a few. The red would have been either matter, which is a plant root, or cochineal, which is a little beetle. <laughs> it's a beetle that grows in tropical areas on cactuses, cacti. Anyway, um, these little beetles, they're like those little ladybugs you're seeing in your windows right now, and they have a very hard shell. And when they're gathered and then the shells are crushed, that gives you a, a very permanent potent red dye. And it is a purple red, whereas matter, which is a plant, gives you an orangish red. And in early, um, in colonial times, in early settler times, they would have had madder. If there was a storekeeper, they could have bought indigo and cochineal. So you just have to look at the range of the reds to kind of see which, which red it is. And the historic textiles that um, evolved in this country were the pieced quilts. Now why that was is because anything that was woven, anything that the, um, the fibers were grown at home, which would be sheep's wool or flax for linen, any of those things took a long time to grow and to process. So what had to happen in order to create, let's say, 
uh, a blanket or a linen uh, length of clothing uh, would be. Uh, for the wool, you would raise the sheep and then for a year and then in the spring they would get sheared. Then you would wash that wool, that would be the fleece that came off of them. Doesn't hurt the sheep, by the way, they're happy because they're cooler. Um, and so that wool then is carded and then spun on a spinning wheel, then dyed and then uh, dressed onto the loom and then woven into like a plain blanket like you saw. If it's linen, the linen has to be grown and then pulled up by the roots and dried and the seeds harvested off the top. And then the linen um, comes from the flax plant stem. So <laughs> all these bundles of flax have to be redded. You either put them out on a field so the dew can rit them or rot them, or you put them in a non-moving stream, or you put them in a baby pool with water. That's what people do today. And so what that does is it sort of rots the outside of the fiber, and then it can be broken off. And there are tools to help you do that. Um, but that fiber is broken off, and then what you are left with after more processing, it looks like blonde hair. That's spun into linen yarn. Linen doesn't take um, dye as well as wool, but it, it can, can do it. But anyway, okay, so those two processes had to happen in order to have maybe a blanket or a suit of clothes. And many times when I've been at a historic demonstration, and I do a lot of them at living history events, if somebody says, well, how long does that take? I would tell them now how long it takes, but back then how long it took. And after I went through that whole process, almost to the word, moms will walk away and go, if it took all that, then my family would be naked. <laughs> And they aren't kidding, because they would be back then. So it's, we are so lucky that we can just buy clothes. Uh, but the piece quilts uh, came about because every little scrap of fabric was precious. Once you'd used up clothing, like if you made a linen shirt for your husband, then when the next boy got big enough, he'd wear it. Then the next boy would wear it, and so, until it was completely worn out. But there might be some little pieces. So you saved all those little pieces. That's where we get pieced quilts. They saved all of the pieces that they could and sewed them together in a design. Uh, one of the things I like um, learning about is Shaker craftsmanship. Um, and I like their, I like uh, Mother Ann Lee's motto, hands to work, hearts to God. If you look uh, at the picture, you are looking down the stairway at the trustee's house at Pleasant Hill, Kentucky. And doesn't it look like a Nautilus shell? Yeah. Uh, their designs, it's like a, almost like a hanging staircase. You know, it just goes up. You just walk up it. Um, but every bit of Shaker design was beautiful and useful and didn't have any extra things that it didn't need. So I like that staircase. Every time we go there, I really enjoy it. The Shakers uh, crafted everything they needed. They were on what was been, would have been the frontier. Now. Um, the Rapp family and the Pleasant Hill Shakers did have uh, some communication. We don't know that there was a ton of it, but they had some. Um, but they would make all their clothes. They would make all their household textiles. They would make everything they needed, all their tools, all their furniture. Everything they needed, they made. And then sometimes they had extra to sell. Um, but these cloaks and things that they're making, that's to clothe what they called the brothers and the sisters, the people in the, in the Shaker community. And that would have been wool. That's a, that's a modern recreation of the cloak that you see here. It's all uh, wool. And I like this also. This is apparently from Mother Anne or from one of the Shaker uh, diaries. Do all your work as though you had a thousand years to live and as you would if you knew you must die tomorrow. Meaning, are you gonna make it good enough that it would be a legacy, um, that you'd be proud to, sh to show it off, um, or just proud to use it, happy to use it? And these are the lapped shaker wooden boxes. It's a close-up of those. And this is where uh, a lot of the weaving took place at the Shaker Sisters shop. Um, and they used to have beautiful displays of uh, a lot of their textiles, but that's on a rotating basis, so you don't always know that they'll be there. Uh, but it's worth checking ahead if you decide to go to Pleasant Hill. It's at Harrodsburg, Kentucky. This is one of the looms that's in the um, Shaker Sister shop. 
This is very much like one of the antique looms that I have, and I weave on antique ones and I weave on modern ones. Um, the antique ones take up a lot of space. So what's required there is a lot of space and a very patient family. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one of whom is here today. Um, in fact, when they were little, when my girls were little, um, there was a big loom in the sunroom, and uh, they just played around underneath it. Like, they probably didn't know that other houses don't have those. Um, but it was just part of the furniture. All right, this is a shaker towel. They would make all their towels, all their household textiles. This is made out of linen, so that whole process of growing in the flax and processing it, spinning it and weaving it. Uh, this is a particular weave. Um, it might be Huck Lace. I need to look it up. Um, and then you see the markings, because there were different uh, families. They didn't mark it as their personal initials. They marked it for the family that they lived, like the East Family Dwelling or the North Family Sisters um, Shop or whatever. Um, and so they did, they also had two and four harness looms. We talked about four harness. Um, they would weave plain cloth, they would weave twill cloth. And if you're wearing blue jeans, if you look down really close at your blue jeans, that's a sort of a diagonal pattern of the weave that's twill. That's what that is. Um, but they made items for sale. So they made a lot of bonnets. The world liked buying those bonnets. They, they sold seeds that they'd raised from their heirloom um, plants and vegetables. Uh, they sold some woodworking and, and leatherwork and so on. This is one of the um, famous hooked rugs from the Shaker Village there in Pleasant Hill. Um, and again, a way to use up very tiny but precious scraps of fabric. And Marilyn would know more how this got made, but I think it's just little pieces into a background, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's like if you see a hooked rug, you know, it has a pile, it, has, it sticks up from the background. These were little pieces that they saved, maybe from men's coats, maybe from cloaks, you know, we don't know. Um, but the design that they made is, is still just as fresh today. Then things changed. <laughs> so if you look at the loom on the right, I don't know if you can see it, there, is, um, there are punched cards coming down from the top of the loom. They're on a continuous loop. They have holes punched in them. I'm old enough to remember when computers had punch cards. That's how they worked. All right, so that's how this was. It could um, actually make it possible to control every individual thread across a coverlet, which might be a 1,000 and to make a design by how you program the punch cards. So the coverlet that you see there, the 1852, that is very typical of a, it's called a jacquard uh, coverlet. The uh, weavers would put their uh, name in the corner. Many times it was their name. Sometimes it was also who they were going to weave it for and the date. And then we can tell if there's no name and date, sometimes we can tell who wove it because they all would have dis distinctive borders, certain shapes that they used over and over again. And the one on the right is one of my particular favorites. It's 1850, which is late. Um, almost to the Civil War, people were still weaving. But after that, um, textile mills out east made it so you could buy cloth. You didn't have to go to all this, this trouble. Uh, but this one is from Sarah Latterette, and she was the only female jacquard coverlet weaver that we know of, and she lived in Fountain County, Indiana, with her family. Her father and her brothers were also weavers. So this is one of hers, and the, the, the flower, or the peony, or whatever it is in the corner, that tells you it's a, a Latterette coverlet. Now, here today, if we go into the archives, we can see a shirt that's made out of linen, would have been home processed flax from the Harmonist era. It's in the collection here. And this is the shirt flat in the top corner. And then you see a detail of the sleeve. Look at those stroke gathers, how tiny those are and how tiny the stitches are. You can barely see stitches. They're very tiny. Um, and linen isn't the most fun thing to stitch that tiny, but you can do it. And then these are the initials in, in cross stitch. That was a common way to mark uh, clothing and bed sheets and, and blankets. So this is a treasure. This is an absolute treasure to have this. Um, the next slide shows how they would have made these. Back a long time ago, uh, clothing was made to fit the length of fabric that you could weave. 
So if you look on the left diagram, you see that length of fabric there? That tells you where you would cut the neck hole, um, where you made a placket, how the sleeves would have been made. So everything was squares and rectangles uh, for many, many years until people started getting cheaper cloth and then you could do more tailoring. And on the right, it shows the way that you would stitch this shirt together. And I made my husband a, a linen shirt and I really like working with linen, um, but a lot of people are, are kind of unfamiliar with how wonderful linen is to wear. So I hope we sort of have a resurgence of that. It's a wonderful fiber to wear. So now what I'm gonna tell you is what people ask me when I do a demonstration. Well, how do you get uh, from the idea to that blanket right there? So um, this is basically from an article that I collaborated with uh, Early American Magazine, Early American Life Magazine, um, and there are articles down here in the, in the magazine. But they thought people needed to know, how does weaving happen? You know, what, what, what does a loom do? So he's, these are the steps to make a blanket like that. Um, first, dye the yarn. So these are skeins of yarn that are dyed, and those are di drying. Then you wind them into balls so you can wind your warping board. This is, on the left is a warping board. That is a way to measure out all of your threads at the same time for the fabric you're going to weave that you're going to put on your loom. So you have to know how long the fabric needs to be, plus extra for shrinkage and take up. You have to know how wide it's going to be, plus extra, same thing. Then you have to know what the qualities of the threads are. So like wool shrinks a little bit differently than linen wood or cotton wood. So you have to know more about that when you're taking up all of those calculations uh, in order to make a blanket. So then this is the, war when you wind all those threads on the warping board, it's called the warp. So on the right, that's that warp that's taken off, uh, ready to go to the loom. So then you wind the warp. Now, I am a weaver who winds back to front because way back here, I learned that at New Harmony, there are people that wind from the front of the loom to the back. I don't do that. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just not how I know how to do it. So when I do um, any kind of project, I start at the back of the loom and I wind all the threads on. See that board with the little nails? That's called a rattle. And what that does, is it helps you get so many threads per inch because otherwise you would just wind off in a big bunch and that wouldn't be good <laughs> for what you want to do. So on the back, this is all wound on. And then as you come around to the front of the loom, you start threading those heddles. Heddles are a metal, little metal wire with an eye in the middle. Every single one of them has an eye. And you thread those in a certain order by the weaving draft that you've chosen. See the diagram up in the left corner? That's a weaving draft. See those little squares? That tells you how many heddles of each, on each harness you thread and in what order. So the old drafts looked like music. They were little dots and dashes, but we can do it on a computer. Um, and then going down the side, it tells you how you would treadle that, how you would throw your shuttle and how you would push the treadles to make the design come out that you wanted. And with a design like that, if you threaded it like this, you don't have to treadle like that. You can treadle a different way. And you can get a different design out of it. So it has lots of possibilities. So anyway, these are all, these have been threaded and they're just tied waiting to go to the next step, which is then all those threads go through what's called the reed at the very front. And it used to be a frame with little strips of river reed cut to a certain size and, and wrapped into the frame with uh, string and then coated with pitch at the top and the bottom of the frame. So now we have stainless steel reeds, which is wonderful. Um, so that's what I'm using right there. But you still, if you come across an old loom in a museum, it may have the old real reed uh, with it. All right, so after you got all this threaded, then you tie the bundles at the front of the loom onto what's called the cloth rod. Notice that there's some gaps in between those bundles. We have to fix that. So we weave in what's called a header. Those are just rag strips, like a rag rug would have. And that evens out all the threads, so they're coming straight from the reed towards you instead of gaps in between them. And then twining happens, and that's just, that's a basket technique where the thread goes over and over and over each, each bundle of threads. But it's a nice finish uh, for a woven blanket, so I do it. 
and then weaving you're following the draft. So this is the shuttle wound with one of the colors and this is the design that comes out when you follow the draft. So this is called a goose eye or um, there's some of them that are called a bird's eye. Depends on how big the diamond is. This is uh, from a draft called Triple Draft Bird's Eye and it's from the John Murphy um, weaving book and he, it was 1824. Some of the treasures that people have found are the old draft books where uh, professional weavers or even home weavers wrote down their patterns because a lot of times they didn't. But when they did write them down, they could share them with somebody else. And this is, it's getting to look like a blanket now. But what you see below those sticks, those are the treadles that you push down. Whenever you push down on one or more treadles, the harnesses raise, so all those threads through those heddles raise up and your shuttle can go through. I can show you back there on, actually Melora can show you on her loom. And this is me weaving that blanket. Uh, this is one of the looms um, that I use, which is uh, based on a Swedish design. They made really good looms, they still do, um, but I also have antique looms from the 17 and 1800s, and they weave really well too, they're fun. Okay, so the finished blanket is bird's eye twill. It's hand woven and hand dyed, but I left out some of the things that you would have to do. These are additional processes that would be required. You have to wind all your skeins before you can dye them into a skein form, so many threads per skein. You have to prepare the dyes. You have to know how, how um, dark you want the color, which colors you want to use, which dyes. Um, you have to add mordants to the dye kettles. A mordant is something that helps the dye set or, or bond to the fiber. A lot of times I use vinegar. There's plenty of other mordants, but vinegar doesn't bother anybody, so I use it. Um, then you have to wind the bobbins for the shuttles. You have to keep measurements of the length and the width woven so you know when you're done. Because I usually put at least two blankets on, uh, on my loom, so I can weave one and leave a little space, weave another one. Um, and then you cut the blanket from the loom. Then you tie a knotted fringe. You can see it on these up here. And then you finish or fold the blanket. So finishing is washing and letting it dry. Or if it's going to be a really thick wool piece, like you want to make it into a man's coat, or you want a really heavy blanket, like a stadium blanket, then what you do is you swish it around in the water, um, hot water, then cold water, and repeat that process a lot. So the agitation and the different ch changes in temperature cause the wool to felt and to full. It sort of blooms up until you almost can't see the weave anymore. It's just real thick, which is very warm, quite warm. All right, so these are some things that I've woven. These are uh, textiles of mine. Um, and they're, they were woven at different times. The one on the left, um, the, the two on the left are overshot. Um, and a lot of times I'll use traditional early American colors, which is the navy and the dark red. Um, the two in the middle are checked. One's a, blank, a blue and white wool blanket. The other is uh, napkins. I just wove those out of cotton. Or maybe it's linen, I can't remember. Uh, and then these two are, are wool blankets. And what all those have in common is that they were all um, pictured in the Early American Life magazine at one time or another, uh, the directory issue. So I've been doing this for a long time. Why I first entered Early American Life magazine directory competition, which is a yearly competition nationally, uh, anybody can enter it was because Marilyn Ayler, who is sitting here, said, I think we need to enter the directory. And I was like, there's no way. We would never get in. No. And she's like, yeah, you got to do it. So we did, and we, got, well, we both got in. Can you imagine? <laughs> and so we've been entering since. And a lot of times before the director issue comes out, they'll ask you to send them. Tom Winsack has had so many pieces in that magazine, I can't tell you. So that's a good thing. It promotes what we do. And it gives us a challenge every year. And these are my collaborators, the sheep. Um, we have Shetlands, and they're not very big, um, but they are a wonderful wool breed. They're from the Shetland Islands, and, and their wool is, is wonderful for spinning. It's very soft. A lot of people, when I do demos, say, I can't wear wool, I can't even be around wool. It's so scratchy. And some of it is. There are uh, breeds of sheep that have really scratchy wool, and that's only really suitable for rugs or maybe tweeds like outerwear. But Shetlands have very soft wool, 
And so, you know, if you've never experienced hand-spun uh, wool from Shetlands or Merinos or one of those soft breeds, you should. They're, they're, it's very different. Um, and two of the things that they helped me make were this set of Christmas stockings and this shawl, which was all from hand-spun and hand-dyed and hand-woven cloth. So the sheep started everything. <laughs> And then the craftsmanship and harmony. I thought, you know, this is it's an important talk, but it's also important to preserve things that are like our buildings here in town. Those are of excellent craftsmanship. We need to preserve them. Like the linen shirt that's in the archives, it's being preserved. So um, the stories that you know, come down from your families, those are things that are important to preserve. And why I chose this picture is it wasn't. It's not here anymore. And there are a lot of things that aren't. So. You know, we need to be intentional, in my view, we need to be intentional about preserving those precious things that were made by craftspeople or maybe somebody in your family, a quilt that your grandma made or, uh, you know, something your grandpa did that was woodworking, whatever. Uh, keep it, but keep the story with it. Because we think our kids just know everything we remember and they don't. They don't know, so we need to tell them. And, you have an opportunity this weekend to firsthand see and put your hands on wonderful craftsmanship. This weekend is the Merry Meeting Show and all of the artisans that will be in the granary and in the community house number two have been recognized by this magazine, Early American Life magazine. These are just a few. So um, in the top left is, is John Salomo. He's the other weaver that's in the show. Wonderful weaver. Um, the shaker boxes that you see there, that's Lincoln Trail. They will be here, and they're from southern Indiana. They make beautiful shaker boxes. Laurel Dabbs is coming, and she does the, the carving. We have other wood, wood people as well. Jeannie Proctor's quilts, as you see. Um, the white pine folk art, and we have several people that are doing wool applique, and they're, every single one of them is stunning. I'm, I'm surprised that we have such variety in this almost the same medium, but it, it's amazing. Um, and then ter in terms of stitching, uh, this is Kathy Grafton. You may have come to the lecture before where she talked about the tapestries that she stitched. So this is what she does. And then we got Tom, which we had to have Mary, a Merry Christmas thing. So that's this. Um, but, you know, if you've never really experienced somebody that lives, sleeps, and breathes craftsmanship, this weekend is your, is your chance. Um, come, come to the show tomorrow night at between 5 and 8 and Saturday 9 to 3. And I think you'll be impressed. Now, two things I have to tell you. One is, see this bouquet of flowers? That's from our, um, our garden at the Lentz House, the historic Lentz House. That's from our dye garden. So what's in that bouquet are dye plants. We have marigold, we have cosmos, we have madder. Uh, we have indigo, and um, there's even some woad, which is a blue. Indigo's blue, woad's blue. The matter and the or the matter is red. The cosmos and the marigolds are yellow, uh, but different yellows. Uh, we could have from Indiana. We could have Osage orange. We could have walnut hulls. We could have onion skins. There are a lot of things that give us dye. But this is what we grow over in the Lentz garden, and we grow flax. This is our first year to grow a crop of flax and pull it out of the ground and harvest it. It's on my back porch, there's big bundles. And so we're gonna save the seeds from the flax and we'll save the seeds from the indigo and any other dye plants and plant more again because then it'll, it'll be sort of acclimated to our biome and it won't be bought in the seed that we got from somewhere else. So there's a, oh, the other last thing I have to tell you. Um, if we go back a bunch of ways, Sorry, bear with me. Okay, the jacquard loom. Do you see the punch cards at the top? You have your phone and you have computers and you have your laptop because of that loom. Because that was the precursor of programming and that's why we have computers. So the next time you pick up your laptop or your phone, thank a weaver. <laughs> okay. okay. Does anybody have questions they would like to ask? Mm -hmm. Marlene. Okay, I have a question about the little picture up there where he has this Yeah. Did he have to program that into 
He programmed every bit of it. So that was, that the flowers, the letters, yes. Yeah, every, every row of that cover lot is so many punches right. in a card. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah it's, I don't do it. I don't know how. But it's, it's an amazing thing. The weaver that I was talking about in New Hampshire, that's what he does. He does jacquard coverlets. He's the only one in America that does that. And so he's, he's outstanding. How many sheep do you have? Uh, we have 13. I was telling Jeannie that if anybody needs sheep, um, we deliver. <laughs> and, yes. And um, our, our policy is buy one, get one free. <laughs> Along with the barn cat. So, yeah. Yeah, they are in Knox County. They aren't here in the backyard. Um, any other questions? Does anybody else have? Um, okay, right here, Laura. Well, I, I was thinking when you were describing which cards are the little punch cards and one card per line. It, you know, it's Right, the draw boy in China. Yeah, yeah, it came, the idea, he got the idea because in China, they would have a child that sat on top of the loom and the master would call out which threads to raise up so the shuttle could go through. And um, that was just the child's job, always. He sat up there and he did it. And so I, I think Mr. Jacquard thought, I can make a machine that'll do that. Um, so he did. But yeah, it was, because in China, if you think of their silks and their kimonos, they would have like lilies and lotuses and you know peacocks and all woven into the fabric. That's how that happened. And so this was the next step beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions intertwined. Uh, the first is uh, the new generation, how do you see their concept of art? And then the second question intertwined is what uh, how do you That, um, that's a very good question. I think once people uh, find out how amazingly great it is to make something with their time, that, that is nobody else made it, they made it. It's, it's their piece of you know, creativity. They get hooked on that and they wanna do better and better and more and more. Um, we taught a class for senior learners here at the Working Men's I had all the table looms there, and it was for people 55 and up. And um, a friend of mine's husband had just retired as a, he was a pediatrician for 40 years. He had just retired, he had nothing to do. And so she said, why don't we take Peggy's class? So he came over and did. Um, and he took the first week of class, which I had pre-warped looms and they wove on them. He texted me the next week and he said, I'm going to Illinois. I've bought a 45 harness or 45 inch four harness loom. I was like, you go, Bruce. That's good. Uh, Bruce now, I think he has five looms. I don't know. And he sent me a picture just yesterday of him teaching his seven year old grandson to weave a bookmark on his loom. So he has three grandchildren that he's taught to weave. And I think I used to teach high school, and I would teach the boys and girls, they all learned to knit. Am had to learn to knit. Um, they, they learned how to do this thing, whether it was knitting or, or weaving or whatever it was. And for the first time, it was, I have something to show for my time. It wasn't this. You know, electronics don't make anything. So that was sort of addictive. I would have to go, you have to leave your knitting here. You cannot take it to math. You will be in trouble. So there was a lot of um, new discovery. And I think once we introduce people to new discoveries and then, sh and then guide them in how to do well. You know, nobody wants to make something that looks awful that you're ashamed of. So, you know, our job as the older generation is help them along that journey. So that's kind of what I see. I think it's hopeful. I am hopeful that people are wanting to learn real hands-on processes. I do see that. Thanks for the questions. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, um, uh, Tom knows about this. There, there's an organization called Traditional Arts Indiana, and what they're um, all about is passing on skills and the legacy of how to do things. So um, I will be applying with a young gal from uh, Rockport. She will be my apprentice. I'll be the master weaver. And we're going to apply through that program to just have a dedicated time when I can teach her. She's already learned a little about weaving, but she wants to learn a lot more. And so it's a great program. Actually, last year in their program, they had two net makers. You know, the fishing nets that they put out in the <laughs> Those two older guys taught, one taught a grandchild and one taught somebody else. How to make netting. Well, nobody would know how to make netting unless a master taught you how to do that. So uh, that's a very good program, and we're glad to, to have it. Now, I do want uh, anybody that's associated with the Merry Meeting Show, I'll quit here real, real quick. Would you raise your hand? Tom. Um, okay, so, so we have some wonderful people here in town that are all about craftsmanship, and they could, they could teach me a lot more than what I know about it. Um, but I do think that uh, we owe Marilyn, who's the director, a uh, round of applause for bringing something like that here. So thank you. And I will say, I used to do this in school. You may look with your hands at these woven things, but if you had popcorn, put your hands in your pocket. <laughs> but these are the magazines right here. Okay. Thank you. Jeannie, thank you and the friends for a wonderful 2022 Friends Lecture Series. They did a great job. Um, we still have more programs here before the end of the year at the Working Men's Institute. This Saturday from 3.30 to 5, we have Cass Davis in conjunction with the New Harmony Gallery, Gallery of Contemporary Art. We have a closing reception and a screening of the films Sundown Town and Baptism. That's right here. November 16th, Phil Weary and Dr. Beth Mackey will be having a lecture Having the Last Word, helping you make your final arrangements. Uh, November 17th, this is brand new and just added to the calendar. Norbert Kraft, he's a former Indiana Poet Laureate. He will be reading from his book, Spirit Sister Dance. That'll be right here in the Working Men's Institute, 630. And the final event for uh, the season, uh, December 2nd, our Christmas open house right here in the room, Friday, December 2nd. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks again to the friends. Thanks again, Peggy.